Hello, over the peak people. A bit of a Euro concentration day today. And the map there on the left, on the left, is of Europe and what's going on. I, I found other maps, but they were too complicated about other countries that are going to come in and whatever from the east and things. But what we have here in yellow are the countries that use the euro currency and in blue they're members of the euro uh, European Union but they don't use yet the euro currency so the EU today is blue the euro area is yellow and a new entrant is uh, is it Latvia at the top one of the Baltics so we have the 17 member states of the European Union that use the euro are listed there. Belgium, Germany, Estonia, etc. Estonia, Latvia, Estonia, I don't know, Lithuania. And the non-participants are Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, Denmark, Latvia, Lithuania, Hungary, Poland, Romania, Sweden and the United Kingdom are EU member states but not currently using the single European currency. So, moving on, moving on. This is from, the chart was from the ECB and this is from the ECB as well government debt as a percentage of GDP and as you can see since the uh, Great Recession it's really bounded on a huge 20% now this is for the Eurozone area so two, 2008 and we were at 67% debt to GDP and now we're at 87% so there's been quite a hike up they've used an awful lot of money the government to um, stimulate things and this is government deficit or surplus as a percentage of GDP and it really plummeted down in 2010 to 8% 8 percent, 8 percent per year of extra deficit spending now that should be at 3% to um, go in for the Maastricht criteria but you can see they've really got that quite well back over the last uh, year and a half and it, they've got it from 8 down to 4 now and they're trying to screw the governments um, to get it down to the three that's necessary pushing countries like Spain who signed the contract um, a few days ago and hours later said no we're not going to play the game um, but they're trying to get the government deficits in order because if they get these annual uh, deficits in order then the government debt as a percentage of GDP will naturally not go up any further right that's one of their problems now this is from the same source as you can see same type of chart but I've messed about with it that's why it looks all ups and up upside down this is the unemployment rate as a percentage of the labor force and at the bottom if you look down at the bottom it looks squiggly but it's over 10 uh, 10 and three quarter percent now and it's down because I have flipped the chart over because to me this shows how Europe is really doing with they've put all this stimulus money in and their unemployment rate was doing well at the top there in 2008 before the recession but I've flipped it over because we can see the recession drops all the way down and then you remember in 2010 and 11 everyone thought well this recession kind of is over and recovery will come but we only get that little uh, tit up and after that it's falling away again this is why I've presented it like this there really has been no recovery in employment in the eurozone um, covered here yeah do you understand that should do it's not that tricky Mish has given us this the eurozone unemployment rates at a glance that he's left a few countries out but the we can see the European average there at 10.7 as per the ECB chart there and Spain and Greece over 20 
and great trouble for Ireland, Portugal, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia all over 10%. Cyprus, Italy and France all wrap round about 10%. But down at the bottom, Germany, Luxembourg, Netherlands and Austria down 6 to 4%, a lot different. And the, the, the take from this is, well, what interest rate is appropriate now for the euro area? Do you have it so it's appropriate for Spain, Greece, Ireland and Portugal? Or do you have it appropriate for Austria, Netherlands, Luxembourg and Germany? It's got to be one rate. And it isn't going to be right for anybody, probably. But it's probably going to be more right for Germany, Luxembourg, Netherlands and Austria. I got this from an OECD doc and it's a boring doc. It's all about um, the OECD saying that countries should pump a lot of money into infrastructure but understanding that the country's governments do not have the money that they want to raise their debt to GDP. They say, well, you've got a lot of pension funds in your countries and if you used that money on infrastructure, it would be good for everybody. That was the idea from this PDF from the OECD. But I've dragged this out of it. These are pension assets as a percentage of GDP in the OECD. But I've pulled, pulled out the European zone countries, the four mentioned that were um, with very low unemployment in the Eurozone. Netherlands, right at the top there, has got a huge amount. It's got 130% of the country's GDP in pension assets, a huge amount of invested in pension assets. What they're invested in, I don't know. But that's where they are. They've got an awful lot of them. Conversely, all the way down at the bottom, we find the other three who only have less than 5% of their country's GDP in pension assets. And there's Germany, Austria and Luxembourg. And I really do not understand this. This is OECD, this will not be wrong. But those four countries, normally always grouped together with most everything, are absolutely poles apart in the pension assets that they hold. Now, I'd like to look into this, but I haven't got time, so any information anybody's got, I'd be very appreciative. appreciative. I'd like to hear it. But why is the Netherlands up there at 130% of the of their GDP in pension assets when Germany, Austria and Luxembourg have got less than five. There's something going on there. This is actually interesting. This is generally, but we'll call this for Europe, this is The Economist that's put this together. And average over on the right, average productivity by size of manufacturing firm. It's manufacturing firm, but we can call it for com companies in general. That if you've got a company that employs over 250 people, that is optimal. That is getting your bang for the buck in productivity. That is the way to go. The bigger, the better. Yeah, the bigger, the better. If you drop under... 250 and get down towards 50 in that band 50 to 250 you've dropped back on one quarter of the total of productivity already between 50 and 250 and when you go down to 50 and less you're dropping down even more productivity almost half when you've got 10 to 20 employees compared to the bigger outfits very important because there's so much strain on productivity at the moment and people have really, countries have got to get it right. There must be a move to bigger companies and governments will favour the bigger companies. And what we have here, starting at the bottom if we could, uh, Germany, who has got nearly no very small companies, that's the grey, They've got the Mittelstand, which are the uh, the blue there, the medium-sized countries, but they've got an awful lot of very big companies. And it's similar for Ireland, Sweden, Britain, France. But as soon as we move to Spain, we're starting to stretch that a bit. And Spain is short on the big companies, as is Italy, Portugal and Greece. And this is what is making them uncompetitive, that they have small, unproductive uh, companies in these countries. And as you can see, Greece has got an awful lot of just basically uh, 
one man's one man bands and if you look over on the right again the actual one man bands or the single digit employee uh, companies are slightly more productive than the 10 to 20 um, people companies which is interesting as well but that is the main problem for the pigs is that they do not have the multinationals or the, the, the big companies that they can really get good productivity out of and until they do they will always be falling behind the countries that do have the big companies in the real world Irish house prices are still falling and they're accelerating uh, that chart gives us shows us since 2008 house prices in Ireland have been going down at varying rates and it's getting almost back to the maximum drop that they were having in 2009 when they were dropping at 20% a year and now they're already they're dropping at 17% a year now um, still dropping horrendously so you've got the compound dropping f from all those years put together house prices are getting slaughtered in Ireland and there's no reason that that sort of thing won't move everywhere unless there is a very good reason why the house prices should stay up right and finish with this I forget where it's from but the headline is taxing homes more isn't the answer now it finishes with Russia at the bottom so I'll just concentrate on the top here is my factoid of the day Italians have just replaced Russians as the top foreign buyers of prime central London properties ending years of oligarch dominance according to Frank Knight the only recent reason the Greeks aren't ranked higher is that there are too few of them but they have been buying the Greeks have been moving when they when they can the rich Greeks have been moving and buying real assets London property being one of them Italians are doing it now but this just goes to show the rich have got money mobility where the poor has ha, haven't you can try and tax them here or there but they have the ability to move their money around away from taxes and all other onerous things the rich have an awful lot of advantages that's the end of a bit of a euro roundup some interesting stuff in there i hope for you thanks bye